I am Dr. Leah Leach, if you haven't seen this silly mug before. I am the headmistress of the Wonder Woman Academy. That is something I just made up as today is the very first day we have ever done the Wonder Woman Academy. Uh, I am also the founder of Gals Guide and Gals Guide has existed for uh, about five years now. So, ha uh, This is the very first class and it is Wonder Woman 101. Now, I am a Wonder Woman fan. Uh, I will preface by saying I didn't connect to Wonder Woman until my adult years. I grew up with her likeness pretty much on lunchboxes and uh, on live action shows and on animated TV series, but I really didn't know her that much more than, uh, than an icon, than a figure. I didn't know her story, and I didn't know how it would intertwine with my own story until my adult years. So I like to say that when I was ready, she planted herself into my life and she took hold. <laughs> So it just goes to show that you can be a Wonder Woman fan at any point. You can be a casual observer. Uh, you can be like, I just want to know enough to be dangerous because that seems to be most of my life. I want to know just enough to be dangerous. Um, I do have a Wonder Woman tattoo. Uh, we are going to be making a cross stitch inspired by my Wonder Woman tattoo. Um, my tattoo represents the overall idea of Wonder Woman. You can recognize her right away, even if you're not a super, super fan. Also, she doesn't have arms and legs, but for some odd reason, our minds fill that in. Um, it represents her iconic stature, that idea that she's unfinished and we're all unfinished, that we're not completely drawn and we are still building to be the person that we want to become. So this image uh, allows me, and maybe you as well, to visualize your own arms and legs. Uh, maybe you're blocking something, maybe you're embracing something, uh, maybe you're walking into a disaster to save the day, or maybe you're running away from trouble. <laughs> that glorious you get to fill it in. So to me, that is Wonder Woman. We are all filling in what is Wonder Woman, because we are all Wonder Woman. We are all unfinished. We are all powerful in our own ways. And we can all visualize ourselves in her strength and in her kindness. So let's get into the history. Let's give you like a base layer foundation of Wonder Woman. So this year, uh, 2020, marks the 79th anniversary of Wonder Woman's first appearance. The girl's 79 years old, she's looking pretty good. <laughs> she started in all comics number eight, um, and then seven months later, she got her own comic, the Wonder Woman comic. So except for a couple of months in 2006, Wonder Woman has been in print ever since 1941. That's a pretty long haul. That's pretty good for a comic. Uh, she was created by American psychologist and writer William Marston. He sometimes wrote under the pen name Charles Marston. So sometimes you'll see William Marsden, sometimes you'll see Charles Marsden, sometimes you'll see Professor Marsden. There you go. Uh, also was the creator was his wife, Elizabeth Marston, and artist H.G. Peter. Those were the creators. Now, Wonder Woman is based on the Amazons of Greek mythology, which Bonnie's going to be talking about later this week, as well as early feminists like Margaret Sanger, who I'm going to be talking about later in classes. Oh, she's a peach. This will be fun. <laughs> but we're going to talk about how Wonder Woman was created. So William Marston is a very interesting man, and you can probably read by my face that there's a lot to unpack in the world. It, word interesting, yes. Um, not only was he a psychologist, which makes him very interesting, he also invented the lie detector test, which is very interesting if you think about the lasso of truth that Wonder Woman has that can make her um, opponent suddenly tell the truth. Uh, Cross-promotion advertising? I think so. Uh, but he was also a lawyer. He was an advocate for women's rights, and he was in a polyamorous relationship. He was in an extended relationship with Olive Byrne. Now, a lot of people say that Wonder Woman's first um, 
appearance looks a lot like Olive Byrne, the girlfriend to Elizabeth and William. Um, and so the, the characteristics kind of are Margaret Sanger a little bit, but the physical uh, attribution is Olive. Now, uh, Marsden died of cancer six years after the Wonder Woman got her comic. So Wonder Woman number 28 was the last one that actually had William's stamp on it. All right, that was the last one he did. Uh, but he did set a lot of groundwork on what the character would be and how she would kind of evolve throughout time and what of her framework was. So he said this, in his psychological work, Marsden apparently became convinced that women were more honest than men in certain situations and that they could work faster and more accurately. So a lot of his tests with the lie detector tests made him determine that women were more honest. Uh, there's also a fantastic documentary. Oh, I can point to it. Look at that, that yellow one right there. Uh, it is called Wonder Women, The Untold Story of American Superheroines. It is a long title. It is a very good documentary. It is available at the Gals Guide Library. We're not yet open, but we should be open later this month, and you can totally check it out. But also, if you want it, let me know. <laughs> I am generally in the library. I can do some curbside uh, glorious pickups. Uh, but it's a fantastic documentary. They have a whole bunch of scholars that talk about uh, Wonder Woman and her involvement. And they thought that William Marsden assumed the future of America would be ruled by a queen. This was his idea, that we would be ruled by a queen. And he wanted to get people ready for the idea of strong female leaders because there wasn't strong female leaders in comics and there wasn't necessarily in television and movies. Uh, William Marsden even said, quote, Wonder Woman is the psychological propaganda of the new type of woman who should, I believe, rule the world. He was not playing. <laughs> <laughs> so Marsden got into the comic book industry around 1940. Uh, he interviewed for the Family Circle. Uh, family Circle, uh, when he was talking to them, he said he saw great educational uh, potential in the comic book industry. So Max Gaines hired Marsden as an educational consultant for comic books. And he hired him to work with two particular companies that ended up merging and forming DC Comics. Okay, DC Comics is the home of Wonder Woman, Batman, and Superman. Um, so when these two comics merged, he pitched this idea of a female superhero, and they approved it. So the themes that Marsden created that would be the staple for all the Wonder Woman comics were masculine and feminine social forms, uh, restorative and transformative justice, and dominance and submission. Oh, yeah. <laughs> There was a lot of bondage in the early comics of Wonder Woman. She was shown in chains quite a bit <laughs> in the early comics. Um, scholars describe that as having this amazing visual of always seeing Wonder Woman break out of the chains, that she was in the chains so she could be breaking out of the chains. That would be breaking through the ties that bind and society and all that kind of stuff. Um, there is far less bondage in the modern comics, and that's either a yay or a boo based on your own preferences. <laughs> so now going forward to talk about the comics, there's just a few terms to kind of understand in a geeky way. Uh, there is the golden age of comics, and that is from 1938 to 1950. So that's kind of like the very, the old age, the golden age, the very beginning. Then there's the silver age, which is 56 to 70, all right? Then there's the bronze age, which was 1970 to 1985. Then there's the modern age, which is pretty much 1985 to today. Uh, there's one last Wonder Woman term to understand too, it's called the New 52. Uh, this is a new series that they have been doing of Wonder Woman, of a reinvention of Wonder Woman. And a lot of times they'll say, they'll call it the New 52. 
So, and that started in 2012. So these are the different iterations of not only comic books in Toto, but also how Wonder Woman plays in with them because Wonder Woman has been in print pretty much since 1941. So here is her origin story. And there's, uh, there's a couple of different origin stories because she's been reinvented. But I will go with what her first one was. Um, well, actually, I'll go with what the constant. The constant that has always kind of stayed is that Wonder Woman, her name is Diana, and she is a princess of the Amazons. That has pretty much stayed. Uh, she grew up on either Paradise Island or Themyscira. I call it the mascara, just because it's easier for me to remember and it's the way that it's spelled out for me, the mascara. Plus, I think it's hilarious that she's on an island about mascara. But anyway, the important part of this island is that there are no men on this island. She grows up uh, and she then journeys into man's world on missions of peace and diplomacy. That is pretty much the, the staple that has kind of stayed throughout most of the comic books. There is another origin story that Diana was sculpted out of clay by her mother, Queen Hippotalia, and the Greek gods gave her life from clay. Uh, this would make her the only Amazon who was not conceived by man. See, very important if you're trying to explore the masculine and feminine types, right? Um, George Perez did a story in the 80s and had Wonder Woman's origins be that the Amazons were reborn from the souls of abused and murdered women from a very confusing battle between the gods. So that's got a little bit more of your dark underpinning in there, uh, but he went there. Um, and then in the New 52, the Wonder Woman comics that are new right now, they say that Wonder Woman is the daughter of Zeus. So those are your different kind of origin stories. When it comes to the movie with Gal Gadot, and actually it's pronounced Gadot, I've seen her on so many interviews, and I'm like, really? That's how you, that's, you chose, that's your name, okay. Um, it's not Gadot like Stephen Colbert, you know what I mean? Like I got used to not saying T's, but it's Gal Gadot. Uh, so in the movie, they use almost all three origin stories that I just told you. They kind of use the George Perez of the souls of abused and murdered women, but in a very toned down, a little easier to kind of understand motif. Um, they also do that so it kind of creates a villain, you know, a little bit as well. Um, and then... Yeah, so they just kind of touch on that in the movie. The movie's a little kind of muddled with her origin story, trying to combine lots of different things. Um, so back to the original comic book origins, okay? So uh, Wonder Woman learns the skills of a warrior as well as the lessons of peace and love from her fellow Amazons. When Steve Trevor crashes on the island, there is a contest to determine who should receive the honor of taking him back to man's world and acting as an Amazon ambassador. And if I seem like I have some grit, it's because I don't like the Steve Trevor character. <laughs> the Steve character, I understand why he's there, but he bothers the living crap out of me because he's kind of a damsel in distress, but gender reversed. And gender reversed doesn't make it any better. <laughs> But yeah, it's just one of those things. So in the, in the Golden Age and in the Silver Age, uh, Wonder Woman has a crush on Steve. She's always saving him from some kind of trouble. I mean, that boy is seriously accident prone in every single one and she keeps saving him and I'm just like screaming, let him die. Just let him die, just once. But yeah, so Steve is a thing. Um, so let's get into her powers and abilities because especially in the comic book world this is where you are set apart uh this is also where geeks start to fight so they're like okay so in a battle between batman and superman with these powers and these powers who would win yeah well not everybody necessarily knows what wonder woman's powers actually are because as soon as you know them you'll be like why would anybody ever fight with wonder woman she's extremely powerful so get this so her powers and abilities are super strength 
okay? Given to her by Demeter, the goddess of the earth, it is generally accepted that she is stronger than Superman. That's right, girl stronger than Superman. Um, she has superhuman speed, given to her by Hermes, the god of messengers. Uh, the Flash couldn't even keep up with her, right? So she's lightning fast and she can disarm opponents and their weapons and immobilize them. Uh, she has invulnerability and durability, okay? So given to her by Demeter, she can handle radiation, fire, explosions, lava, which, you know, always comes in handy, the coldness of space, and even Superman's heat vision. Girl's got it going on. Uh, she has a healing factor uh, given to her also by Demeter. She can heal injury without even scarring. Of course, without even scarring, she's got that beauty that she needs to maintain. Uh, flight, given to her by Hermes. Now, it wasn't until the modern age that she actually got flight because everybody knows the invisible jet, right? Yeah, the invisible jet. So, uh, the invisible plane, sorry. Sometimes I'll call it jet, and sometimes I'll call it plane. Um, I think it's a dyslexia thing. Uh, but it wasn't until that modern age that she could actually fly, and it was kind of more gliding. It was like Buzz Lightyear falling with style a little bit. Um, but she could glide on air currents, and she could summon and find, amazingly, that invisible plane. Uh, she also has the power of divine wisdom given to her by Athena, which is the goddess of wisdom. This includes tactical wisdom. It also includes a very solid moral sense as well. Uh, super stamina. The girl does not need to rest or sleep. And if you have been a mom, you understand this. <laughs> you don't need to sleep or rest. What are you kidding me? You're Wonder Woman. Uh, and of course, it's, it's such a ridiculous superpower, but it's technically a superpower. Great beauty. Yay. But given to her by Aphrodite, it's not really a power, but you know, it's a power. <laughs> uh, she also has enhanced senses given to her from Artemis, the goddess of the hunt. Uh, she has keen eyesight, hearing, taste, and touch. She can see her mark from great distances. Um, and the last one is divine powers, given to her from Athena. On occasion, she has been able to, uh, to go through illusions. She's been able to talk to animals, so she's got a little bit of a Disney-ness to her, and she's been able to uh, project herself and talk to the gods in the other regions, all right? So, yes. So those are her powers. She has two weaknesses. <laughs> Ooh. So already you're starting to see she's a very powerful superhero, and yet girl sitting in a plane for most of Justice League? Yes, yes she is. Uh, but here are her weaknesses, and read into them what you will. Her first one is piercing weapons. So swords and knives and things that have sharp pointy ends and are piercing. That's one of her weaknesses. Uh, and the other weakness is her bracelets. If they were bound together by a man, all of her powers would be lost. This was only in the golden age of comics, though. Uh, this was very much part of the bondage and submission thing. Those are her weaknesses. <laughs> I think she can still take a lot of people down with those two weaknesses. Uh, so now let's talk about her weapons. That's another uh, comic book thing to do. She has the Lasso of Truth, which I briefly mentioned. So the Lasso of Truth, as far as its origin, is made by Hesephus. And it was uh, also from the Golden Girdle of Gaia. Uh, I, I want to say Gaia. Gaia. Um, it forces people to tell the truth or obey very much also a dominance and submission-like thing. It can restore lost memories. It can cause illusions. It can cure insanity. And it also can protect people from magical attacks. This is what the writers call, this thing will do whatever I need it to do in a story, <laughs> okay? <laughs> when a weapon has a lot of different variations, I'm like, yeah, it's a story plot. Um, her bracelets, okay. Her bracelets were created from Zeus's shield. 
They can deflect bullets. I mean, she's bulletproof, but they can deflect bullets. So cool. Um, in the golden age of the comics were meant to be her submission. Uh, it was said that the Amazons controlled and limited her powers by the bracelets. In other words, if she removed her bracelets, she would become even more powerful. This is something that I keep looking for in the movies. If there is in the new movie, which we will get to the movies, if she ever looks like she's about to take off those bracelets, know that this might be what they're trying to do. Be like, she's even more powerful without her bracelets, you know. Because you know how when we all are about to fight, we take off our jewelry? Sorry, I act like everybody's about to fight. But usually we take off our jewelry and then we're really ready for a fight. I believe it's going to be like that sort of thing. Uh, yes. Um, the Royal Tiara. Woo! Supposedly this thing is razor sharp, which I can tell you this one is, because it hurts. Again, they hurt. <laughs> they're razor sharp, and they're also meant to be a boomerang. So, you know, you can take that thing off, and it'll come right back to you. Sweet. It will hurt. I mean, these ones, these fake ones, will hurt somebody if I throw them at them. Um, and then... The invisible plane, I will technically have down as a weapon. Uh, when she couldn't fly, she had the plane and she controlled it telepathically. That's how she always knew where it was. So, yeah. Uh, her armor. So her breastplate is armor. Um, and from time to time, she has a shield. Mostly in the movies with Gal Gadot, she has a shield. In the new 52, she seems to have a shield. But that's not a necessarily common thing. Uh, sword. For somebody who's one of two weaknesses is a sharp pointy thing. The girl has a sword from time to time. I don't know, maybe don't carry one of the things you have a weakness for so that your enemy could get you and hurt you with it. But I mean, that's just me. She did have two swords um, uh, once, um, but mostly the swords are now used in the new 52 comics, which I'm like, you, you know better by this point. And she does sometimes have them in, uh, in the movie. So yeah, cool. Storylines, glorious storylines. So I won't go too much into every single storyline because there's been a couple of different um, iterations, but like I said, enough to make you dangerous, enough to know a little, you know, kind of foundational knowledge. So in the golden age of comics, she forms a relationship with Steve Trevor. Yeah, Steve. Um, so he's crash landed on Paradise Island and she wins the right to return him to man's world and fight the Nazis. I mean, it's such a package deal, right? Uh, in the Silver Age of comics, Wonder Woman did have a major setback as she surrendered her power so she could stay in man's world. The Amazons were going into another dimension and she wanted to stay with D. So she opened a mod boutique. Oh, she opened a dress store. All right. She opened a dress store. She meets Ai Ching and he becomes her mentor and he teaches her martial arts. It was the, it was messed up this silver age that they did. Where she, so she runs a dress store. She is learning martial arts and she goes on a series of mission impossible missions. These are horrible. All right, every single one of these issues, I read a couple of them and I'm like, I can't, I can't even do this. Um, so not until the 1970s does the girl finally say, you know what, screw this whole dress store thing. I'm gonna go back to being Wonder Woman. Uh, so in the modern age, there's a handful of successful reboots. Uh, one had a really strong connection to Greek and mythology roots. Um, another one had an alternative timeline that the world completely forgot who Wonder Woman was. Um, and so she got a new sword and a new shield and all this kind of good stuff. Uh, in the ones that are out right now, the new 52, Wonder Woman is hooking up with Superman. That's right. Fan fictions finally made that happen in a comic book. Uh, but it's also showing her multitasking, which I'm like, well, that's a modern equivalent. So she's queen of the Amazons, she's a Justice League board member, and she's also the god of war. So the girl has a lot of multitasking to do to keep her busy everywhere, right? So now, outside the comic books, 
which is really important with this particular character. Um, outside the comic books, Wonder Woman's staying power really came in the 1970s. Not only did you see her finally get rid of the stupid boutique uh, thing, but also Gloria Steinem used Wonder Woman as the cover of Ms. Magazine in 1971 and really catapulted Wonder Woman as a feminist icon. So this helped launch the Wonder Woman television show with Linda Carter. I feel like Linda Carter is the keyword to bring out the other tier. Um, and that show ran for four years. And according to Linda, it made a lot of money for the network. A lot of money. <laughs> Don't think girl saw as much as the network did, but a lot. Uh, then there was animated series like Super Friends and Justice League and Young Justice. They have all featured Wonder Woman in sometimes frustrating ways, but she's in it. Uh, most recently into the animated world, uh, we have superhero girls, uh, which is actually really cute. And Wonder Woman has pants. So, sorry, it makes me so excited that Wonder Woman can have pants. And just the idea she has the choice of pants um, really, really makes me happy. And plus it also means with the superhero uh, girls, there's more um, toys. <laughs> Sorry, child at heart. Do you see I have a tiara? Yes. Uh, but not until seven Superman movies and eight Batman movies, you know they weren't all good, did we finally get a Wonder Woman movie. One. One. <laughs> we got one. Uh, so 76 years after her introduction to the world, we get a Wonder Woman movie, okay? It's directed by Patty Jenkins. It's written by a dude. <laughs> it's based on a story by three other dudes, but by Great Hera, it's really good. <laughs> it's really, really good. Um, it has the largest opening weekend for a film ever directed by a woman. And that means it beats Twilight, and that makes me so happy. <laughs> Because saying that Twilight is the best, or not best, sorry, not best, oh my god, the most money-making movie directed by a woman is horrible for my soul, basically. Um, <laughs> but Wonder Woman's box office grossed $822 million, and the reason why I bring that up is because it's the largest worldwide box office for a female director as well. Uh, that record beat Jennifer Young Nelson of Kung Fu Panda 2. That's right, as a female director in my past life, the biggest claims to fame were Twilight as the best directed female film domestically and Kung Fu Panda 2 <laughs> for worldwide box office. Thank goodness Wonder Woman with Gal Gadot beat both of those records. But more than that, it was a very big deal for the industry. It was not easy to bring Wonder Woman to the big screen. So in full disclosure, in 2016, I retired from filmmaking, okay? So I know a lot more about the film stuff, that's more of my wheelhouse, than the comic side of it. So that's where I kind of geek out. I've also been following this idea of a Wonder Woman movie for years. So therefore, obsessed, basically. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a little bit of some insider knowledge of how many times they tried to get the Wonder Woman movie made. And so therefore you can know what a big deal it is that the movie even got made and that beating all of those box office records is an even bigger deal. Basically, you're gonna have some um, context to numbers, because numbers are just numbers. It's context that actually give them any kind of value. So uh, it all started in 1974. Not until 74 was anybody willing to even think of the idea of making a Wonder Woman movie. So there was a TV film. This is when we were making a lot of like TV movies, you know, movies of the week and stuff like that that were airing on basic TV. Uh, Kathy Lee Crosby starred as a Wonder Woman character in a TV film. It was intended 
to jumpstart a TV series, okay? If it got enough viewers, they were gonna do a TV series. It got a quote, respectable, but not wondrous ratings. Uh, so it went back to the drawing board. It did, however, open the door for Linda Carter as the TV series. So yay, right? Now we jump to 1996. Ivan Reitman, the director of Ghostbusters, was the producer and possibly the director for a Wonder Woman project. Uh, the Wonder Woman movie was worked through, was greenlit, but the project never went anywhere. It just kind of stayed in limbo with Ivan Reitman attached to it for a good long time from starting 90, 1996. From 2002 to 2007, Jeffrey Robinoff is president of production at Warner Brothers, and he is in charge of the TV and film distribution arm of DC Comics. He is a jerk. I'm not going to hide it. I don't like Jeffrey Robinoff. It will become very clear in a second why Jeffrey Robinoff is a jerk. So from 2005 to 2007, Josh Whedon, Josh Whedon, your Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Serenity Firefly, uh, Avengers 1 and 2, He's working on a Wonder Woman project for Warner Brothers. After the Serenity movies, after Firefly, after Buffy. So he's working on all of this after. He, at that point, is the king of the geeks and known for fantastic female characters. Um, one would say he was the chosen one <laughs> for a little bit of time to work on the Wonder Woman movie. But he dropped out of the project due to creative differences. Here's what the creative difference were. From 2007 to 2013, Whedon drops out because Jeffrey Romanoff becomes studio head of Warner Brothers and suddenly announces to the world that Warner Brothers will no longer make movies with female leads. This is why I do not like this guy. And this is why from Warner Brothers from 2007 to 2013, when Jeffrey Romanoff is in charge, there is no Wonder Woman. There is no idea of Wonder Woman project. That is not going to happen. But some people kept trying, even though the head of Warner Brothers, who owns the property of a movie for, for Wonder Woman, said, mm -mm, no, he got mad at Jodie Foster and Nicole Kidman that their movies didn't make enough money. And so he just said, well, then nobody gets to play. And by nobody, I mean women. Fantastic. So now George Miller, George Miller is the guy who directed the Mad Max movies. He tried to make Justice League mortal, okay? And that would have had Wonder Woman in it. So Megan Gale was cast as Wonder Woman. Army Hammer was cast as Batman. But the project got shelved because of a writer's strike. Okay, um, and one of the other problems was <laughs> Jeffrey Robinoff. <laughs> okay, um, then Paul Feig, Paul Feig, who uh, directed the reboot of Ghostbusters, and our Patty Jenkins, who ended up actually directing Wonder Woman, uh, they both pitched a new version of Wonder Woman. Then in 2013, the world changed a little bit as. Jeffrey Romanoff was either fired or quit, just depends on what story you read, because he says he quit, of course he does, and then Warner Brothers said, no, we kicked his ass out, so like, whichever one you read, doesn't matter, but ding dong, the witch is dead, he left. Uh, six months later, after he left, Gal Gadot is cast as Wonder Woman in Batman v Superman, okay? Batman v Superman, I can't stand it, it sucks, but I got Wonder Woman, <laughs> it's a step. It's a step, all right? So a few months later, after the production of Batman v Superman, they announced that they are going to make a Wonder Woman movie. And I am excited. However, nothing is normal at Warner Brothers. Nothing, <laughs> nothing. Uh, so Mc Michelle McLaren, she signed on to direct Wonder Woman first, okay? Patty Jenkins also pitched for the job, but she, uh, she went on and, collect and was working on other projects. Um, Michelle was an acclaimed TV director, and she did not have a feature film under her belt. Creative differences started to emerge, and Michelle left the project, and Patty Jenkins was in. There was more shaky ground before they started filming, but they started filming. 
okay? So yay, filming is happening. So Batman v Superman uh, hits theaters, and I will say it's crap, but to be more fair, uh, reviews were mixed. <laughs> That's a fair way of saying it. Um, however, one thing that seems to be very clear, people loved Gal Gadot as Wonder Woman. Like there didn't seem to be much debate on her. Like everything else there was debate, but they were like, yes. Then Suicide Squad came out. So Suicide Squad is also a DC property and it was not a slam dunk. Um, one former Warner Brothers employee wrote an open letter saying that Wonder Woman uh, project was also a mess and it was all going to be just Warner Brothers, just like tailspin disaster, basically. But Patty Jenkins uh, denied the rumors and said, no, Wonder Woman is not a mess. It's going to be fantastic. I'm doing my best. Just let me, just wait till you see it. Just wait till you see it. Um, so now a month before the movie is released, a month before Wonder Woman is finally going to be released to the theaters, fans start noticing a lack of marketing. And there was a serious lack of marketing. There wasn't many ads. Yes, the poster was in, you know, the movie theater. But usually, like, Batman v Superman, like, they're on cereal boxes. You know, they're on chips. They're, they're everywhere. The cross-promotion marketing is everywhere. And yet, for Wonder Woman's summer release, didn't seem to be much of it. So fans started taking it upon themselves to spread the word. This is when I love fandom, when it's like, no, 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 we're going to do the job. So we started posting trailers and posters and quotes and, you know, the, the history of Wonder Woman of what a big deal this is. So then the audience previews started coming in and people were glowing about the movie, including myself. I don't hide it. I can't. This face doesn't can't hide anything. Um, so after a journey just to get a Wonder Woman movie made, like we didn't care, like just give us one. You know what I mean? Like Rambo is a thing. <laughs> you get crap movies all the time, guys, superheroes. We just want one and we're sick of Sucker Punch as our one. Sorry, I've, I've gotten into many a Sucker Punch debate where it's like, yes, it's crap, but we don't have many female superhero movies. So I'm gonna have to take it. <laughs> But after a 76 year struggle, the fact that it came out is great. And it's quite an accomplishment because there's so many things that could have gone wrong and that tried to go wrong. So if there are some imperfections that you see in that movie, take it. <laughs> Because it could have been so much worse. But I say that about a lot of movies. It is one of those things where it's like, yeah, no, it could have been worse. But it also could have been better. Uh, so this weekend was slated to be the release of the follow-up movie, Wonder Woman 1984. It was supposed to be 4th of July weekend. But because of COVID-19 and because of the closing of the movie theaters, it has been pushed to October 2nd. So that's the new date is October 2nd. Um, quite possibly it might get a Christmas release. Um, that was a rumor that I was hearing too. They look at those big tent areas. Um, and they're also looking at, of course, what COVID-19 uh, is doing. So, but October 2nd is the date to mark on that calendar right now for Wonder Woman 1984. So that is the Wonder Woman 101 history enough to make you a little dangerous, a little knowledgeable, a little context. I don't know why that word's so hard today. I'm gonna blame the tear of taking away blood flow um, on Wonder Woman. So uh, I will open it up for questions and discussions. We can easily just, you know, yell and scream and frustrating and say what we love about the comic books and movies and all that kind of good stuff.